أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحق ما الحق وما أدراك ما الحق كذبت ثمود وعاد بالقارعة فأما ثمود فأهلكوا بالطاغية وأما عاد فأهلكوا بريح صرصر عاتية سخرها عليهم سبع ليال وثمانية أيام حسوما فترى القوم فيها صرعا كأنهم أعجاز نخل خاوية فهل ترى لهم من باقية؟ رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي فالحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ثم ما بعد ونسجن السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته نبدأ اليوم سورة الحاقة سورة الحاقة is the 69th surah of the Quran and this is from the surahs of the Quran that are that uh, are dominated by the theme of inthar of warning from the very beginning it describes judgment day in you know and, and the terrifying moments of judgment day uh, and the word it begins with is al-haqqa al-haqqa actually um, comes from the word haqq and the word haqq means truth but it also means that which is deserved so haqqa yahiqu in arabic of something to materialize as a verb it means like haqqa alayhim al-adhab the quran says the punishment materialized against them it became a reality so haqiqa uh, is reality itself Right? The mustar of it, haqq and haqiqa, reality itself. But haqq also in the Arabic language, haqq alayhi al-adhab could also be understood as the punishment was rightful on them. It rightfully came upon them. Of something that happened that should have happened. That is bound to happen, that deserves to happen. That's also haqq. Now from it you have the ism fa'il. Like haqqa yahiqqu haqqan fahuwa haqqun. It's... it's uh, uh, the, the mudaaf form, this is the irregularity I haven't taught you guys yet, it's coming this week. Right, where the two letters fuse together, instead of haqiqun fa'ilun, it comes haqqun. And from it you get haqqatun, the feminine form of it. Now the tamar buta is there for mubalagha purposes. Or it's there to describe what is going to happen, you know. So this al-haqqa, the tamar buta, I'm more convinced that it's actually there for mubalagha purposes, for either for marra purposes, for this a singular great instant, or for the purpose of hyperbolizing. And what it means is the ultimate reality that is bound to happen, or the thing that is, a, that is bound to, that is rightfully going to occur, that is meant to occur, that should occur. And the, the word by itself, when a sentence in Arabic begins with a noun, an ism, and it begins in the rafa form, Right? It begins in the Dhammati and Al-Haqqa too. Then that constitutes a Muqtada. Then you will have to say that that is a Muqtada. And when you have a Muqtada, then what are you expecting? That's, if that's the subject of the sentence, what are you expecting? You're expecting Khabar. But there's no Khabar. Al-Haqqa, there's no Khabar. And actually the next sentence is another Muqtada. Mal-Haqqa. Mal-Haqqa. It's a new sentence. What is Al-Haqqa? So the first ayah was a word by itself and not a complete sentence, not a complete thought. This is done in the Arabic language as a particular rhetorical device. A muptada is mentioned, the subject of a sentence is mentioned, and the purpose of mentioning it is to, in, in like in any sentence, when you start a sentence and you say the first part, then the listener is immediately anticipating, waiting on the next part. But when the, and so the, one of the benefits of just mentioning a muqtada is you definitely get the attention of your audience because they're anticipating, well, how are you going to finish that sentence? You know? Like if I just came in here and I said, my trip this week? Silence. You're like, what happened? Your exam scores? Muqtada. Where's the khabar, Ustad? Where's the khabar? <laughs> The competition winners? <laughs> so muqtada, where's the khabar? And it, it, you know, the audience really wants to know now. And then what you could do further to incite, like curiosity, is you start over and you say, mal haqqa. What reality am I talking about? What is that thing that is bound to happen? 
that is going to occur. And by the way, uh, the ism fa'il, one of its rhetorical benefits, is some, as opposed to the mudari, the present tense form. Because the ism fa'il can be used in the meaning of the present tense. Like ana jalis, jalisun is a present tense, actually. The, the, the ism fa'il can be used as a verb. But the difference between, of the several differences between the verb and the ism fa'il, one of the beautiful benefits of it is the ism fa'il is more immediate and around the corner. So for example, you're on the phone with somebody, and they're waiting for you to come over, and they're waiting for you to come over, and you're like, I'm, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. If you say, ana aati, the, the fi'il, ana aati, then the fi'il means I'm coming, but you didn't say that you're coming, you're pretty much there. I'm coming right now. But if you said, ana aatin, atayati, ityanan fahuwa, aatin. Ana aatin, aati atun, a sister said, that means I'm right there, I'm coming right now, right now, right now. There's an immediacy. al haqqa is an ism fa'il. What does that create? The immediacy of the punishment that is about to come, judgment day that's about to come. Has it been described as judgment day already? No. And that's important. Because there are two realities, two very scary realities that all prophets warned about. And they, all, they both have to be understood and they're actually at the center of understanding the larger philosophy of our religion. And those two threats are the nation will be destroyed here in this world if they reject a prophet. And then the judge, judgment day for all of humanity. There are actually two threats that every messenger comes with. One threat is you're going to face consequences here. The nation will be annihilated here. The flood of Nuh salam, the fire from the sky. You know, the nation of Lut alayhi salam. Whether it's, uh, you know, we're going to read in this, in this when uh, the ayat are coming, about the windstorms, you know, about floods. Now that's one punishment. And then the ultimate punishment, of course, is judgment day, or the ultimate warning is about judgment day. Why do we have to make, make, understand that those two realities exist? Especially Muslims. Now, like, in every prophet's case, they understood that there are two kinds of warnings. But in our case as Muslims, we have to go out of our way to properly understand that there are two kinds of warnings. You know why? Because that means that the Prophet himself وسلم, came with two kinds of warnings. In keeping with the legacy of all previous Prophets, he also came with two sets of warnings. Makkans will pay in the Akhirah, but Makkans will also pay in this dunya. That's a fulfillment of God's promise as consist, a consistent promise of Allah to all Prophets and Messengers. When the Messenger is denied, then the nation pays in this world. The nation rejecting him in the flesh, the nation that saw him with their own eyes, pays in this world. And you know why that plays such an important role? Because the ayat of Surah At-Tawbah, Surah At-Tawbah itself. Surah, you can think of Surah At-Tawbah as, I, I like to describe it as the flood of Nuh alayhi salam. I like to describe it as the rain from the sky. Or the earthquake. Or the windstorm. You know? That's what the Surah At-Tawbah is. It's the Surah of Qital of fighting and killing the disbelievers wherever you find. All those ayat you hear, kill the believers, dis disbelievers wherever you find them and all of that. You know what that was? That was Allah's final punishment, the warning fulfilled for Muhammad Rasulullah Wasallam for the nation that disbelieved in him, which is the Meccans. Just like the promise of Nuh of the, of the warning that the nation being destroyed then and there. It's actually part of divine punishment. Those ayat, if not understood in that light, what happens? You start thinking of those ayat as the foreign policy of Islam. If you don't understand that, there are two kinds of punishments. There are two kinds of punishments. The Quraysh are being warned about two kinds of punishments. And this, this is why I, I said in the beginning, understanding these two sets of punishments. When Allah gives warning about what's coming, it's a reality. It's bound to happen. It's not just Akhirah. What's bound to happen is you, Quraysh, better watch it. You're going to be paying for the, your, your actions. You're going to be paying for the... You're going to, there are going to be consequences for your deeds. Okay? So, مَا الْحَاقَّ وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا الْحَاقَّ And what will give you any clue what the ultimate reality is? Is there anything that can give you some idea? Now, مَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا أَدْرَاكَ Interestingly in Arabic, أَدْرَى يُدْرِي also means like عَرَفَ يَعْرِفُ Or أَعْرَفَ يُعْرِفُ actually, to give you a clue. To give you some indication. 
what ultimate reality is going to hit you? Is there anything that can give you even the slightest idea? This kind of language is used at the end of Quran. You've heard it before. Al-Qari'atu. Mal-Qari'atu. Wa ma adraka mal. Qari'atu. Same format. The word Qari'ah is coming in the next ayah, by the way. So we'll see. Allah, in this case, the word Allah uses haqqa, which is actually more broad than Qari'ah. Qari'ah is used when somebody bangs on a door. When somebody bangs on a door or somebody's taking a nail or a ram and they're you know, jamming it into the door and that, like that loud you know, thud, that's qari'ah. It doesn't let you sleep, it doesn't let you rest. It wakes you up. Haqqa is the reality. That it, this is for real, it's really happening, it's not a nightmare. So al-qari'ah, the surah al-qari'ah is more specific. But here, this is more general. This is the overall, the ultimate reality of the consequences of your deeds, both in this world and in the next. And to give you an idea, because the question has been raised, وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا الْحَاقَّ and Beautifully in the Qur'an, مَا أَدْرَاكَ What might give you a, a clue? You know, when Allah asks that question, nobody can answer it except Himself. Nobody can answer that question. What might even give you a clue? So Allah is giving us a clue now. كَذَّبَتْ ثَمُودُ وَعَادٌ بِالْقَارِعَةٌ the nations of Thamud and Ad were they, they lied. They lied against, or they considered Al Qari'ah a lie. They were told about Al Qari'ah too, just like we're told Al Qari'ah to Al Qari'ah wa Madra kam Al Qari'ah. They were warned by their prophets about Al Qari'ah also, the great knocking punishment, the, na the, the great knocking destruction. Now, what is that? I want you to visualize what that means. People are in their homes. They're feeling safe. And all of a sudden, you know, rocks start raining from the sky. And what are they hearing? You're hearing constant knocking. You know when a thunderstorm comes and you hear the knocking on the ceiling? You know? Or there's a tornado and things are hurling in the air. And they're slamming into your window and into your walls. And what are you constantly hearing? Knocking. Banging. Can you sleep in, that, in those moments? This terrifying scene. You're stuck and all you hear is these horrifying sounds that are getting louder and louder and closer and closer. This is Al-Qari'ah. This is what the word means. And they lied against it. They considered all of it a lie. فَأَمَّا ثَمُودُ فَأُهْلِكُوا بِالطَّاغِيَةِ Then as far as Thamud is concerned, then they were destroyed. أُهْلِكُوا the passive form. Notice the U and the E, right? So أُهْلِكُوا They were destroyed by means of الطَّاغِيَةِ This الطَّاغِيَةِ is understood in two ways. I'll share both of them with you. This, it's actually about the letter Ba here. The harf jar Ba. Ba could mean because of. Ba could be Ba sababiyah. So that, in that sense, it would mean that the, the Thamud was destroyed because of the excessive rebellion. Because of their ex excess in rebellion. That's one meaning. Taghiyah could also mean one of the names of the punishment by which they were destroyed. The device by which they were destroyed is a, rebellion, is, is a punishment that rebelled. And what does that mean? You see winds, earth, water, these are things that Allah subdued. He put them, he subdued them. Like the earth is, is the lul to us. Allah compares, remember the com conversation I had with you? Where Allah described the entire earth like an animal that's been subdued and you're walking on it, you're riding it. Right? So it's a, it's a domesticated animal. The, the nice breeze you and I feel is because the winds have been subdued. They're, they're held back. The oceans are subdued when they have calm waves. And if these three creatures were to go wild... You know, because if they're domesticated animals, sometimes they go crazy. And if, they were, if the winds were to go wild, you'd see tornadoes. Like this animal's let loose. The, the rains have been lifted. If the ocean was let go, and its calmness was removed, then it would turn into tsunamis and floods. If the earth was let go, it would create all kinds of earthquakes. Entire nations would sink into the ground. Taha means to rebel. And rebellion is for animals too. When animals are domesticated and they act out of line, then there's a taha. And the beauty in this ayah is the nation was destroyed because of their rebellion. And when they rebelled, Allah allowed the earth and the water and the sky to rebel also against them. That's the, that's the dual nature of this beautiful ayah. فَأَمَّا ثَمُودُ فَأُهْلِكُوا بِالطَّاغِيَةِ You want to get out of line? Fine, I'll let the earth get out of line. I'll let the water get out of line. I'll let it cross the bounds. That's why actually when floods happen in Arabic, you know what they call it? طُغْيَانُ الْمَاءِ 
The rebellion of the water. That's what they literally call it. Because, you know, like soldiers that are disciplined, they stay within a border. They stay in rank and file. That's what a soldier does. When soldiers rebel, they get out of line. The oceans have a border. They have the shalte. They have the shore. That's their border. When the ocean rebels, it crosses the line. So Allah says, for example, later on we'll read, Inna lamma taghal ma'u fil jari. Taghal ma. When the water rebelled. When the water rebelled means when the flood came. So now, فَأَمَّا عَادٌ And as for Ad, فَأُهْلِكُوا بِرِيحٍ صَرْصَرٍ عَاتِيَةٍ Then they were destroyed by means of a wind. Rih, a breeze. That was sarsar. Sarsar means it was extremely bitterly cold. And it hit every time. You know, there's a wind, you feel cold the first time, and then you stop feeling it. You get accustomed to it. But then there's a wind that's cold, Every little piece of it that hits you, it's like it freezes you all over again. And the, the dual syllable here, sar, sar, right? It, the, the, the double syllables is to indicate actually that it hits you over and over again and freezes you and refreezes you and refreezes you. The bitter cold wind. And then Allah adds, atiyah. Ata means to go through something, to go past the limit again, to cross a boundary. And the suggestion is people are inside their homes. These cold, freezing winds are outside. So obviously they've got their doors shut and their windows shut. You know? But the winds just go right through the walls and they freeze them even inside their homes. The winds don't stop. So on the one hand, they're cold. On the other, and this is just the temperature of them. But then on top of that, سَخَّرَهَا عَلَيْهِمْ Allah subdued those winds against them. Allah forced those winds to do that against these people. Tasheed is actually used when you make an animal mush. Or when you finally, you know, you get on a wild horse and you finally, it does what you want it to do. So when you pull at its reins, it runs. And when you pull, you know, or you, you, you push it and you give it a little kick, it runs. And when you pull at it, it slows down. Right? This is this is tasheer. It does what you want it to do. Allah uses this word for His control over the clouds. How oh, He has control over clouds. He makes them mush forward and He puts the brakes on them. Then He makes them go forward. He makes them stop. He makes them rain. They're at His command. They're on. They're uh, you know they're on, on autopilot with Allah Azza wa Jal. He says sakharaha alayhim. Those winds were subdued. They were forced to do this against those people. And what that implies is the winds just weren't blowing anywhere. They were targeting the criminals. The winds were like weapons targeting those criminals. سَبْعَ لَيَالٍ وَثَمَانِيَةَ أَيَّامٍ Seven nights and eight days, continuously. And you can imagine a, a tornado. Tornadoes nowadays pass through a town for how long? Two minutes? Three minutes? What destruction did they leave behind? Subhanallah. Was just, I mean, a few months ago, there was a tornado through Arlington, not too far from here. It touched down at the airport and damaged a couple of planes. And when it passed by Arlington, about 200 homes were completely destroyed. I mean, there's only planks of wood. You, don't even, you wouldn't even think there was a home here. You wouldn't even think that. When I went after, um, after Katrina, when I went to New Orleans, subhanAllah, I went to visit the masjid that was, that was uh, destroyed. It was a masjid close to the water. It's completely, the only thing left was the wudu stall. It's all it was, and there was just planks of wood, a big pile of just wooden planks. It's all it was. Ajeeb. It's shocking to look at. Allah says, this wind came for seven nights and eight days. If wind can do that in a couple of minutes, if a tornado can do that in a couple of minutes, what would seven nights, eight days of non-stop, non-stop, when we hear about thunderstorms coming, rain coming, winds coming, they are like, oh, it's going to pass by. It's going to be a few hours. So evacuate for a few hours or be in a shelter for a few hours. But I don't know of any of us that have witnessed a storm of this magnitude for how long? A week. <sighs> That's beyond our fathom. What would, a week, what, are, what would a storm like that do though? What would it leave behind? Allah uses the, the word that depicts it perfectly. Husuman. Husuman means that which erases all traces of anything. There is no even sign, remnant left of civilization by the time they're done. فَتَرَ الْقَوْمَ فِيهَا sarra. Then you will find the nation, the people, the entire nation lying in it. Sar'a. Sar'a means fainted. Also means lying topsy-turvy like mangled bodies, like, you know, twisted and turned. 
كَأَنَّهُمْ أَعْجَازُ نَخْلٍ خَاوِيَةٍ As though they are the, the hollowed barks, the emptied out barks and branches of palm trees. 